morning, Nick Berenta. How are you doing? Good morning, Jan Recker. Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I got I got a topic that I want to discuss with you today, and it's uh, I actually had two encounters with this topic over the last two weeks. Uh, one of that has to do with editorial work, right, where we uh, get papers to handle as editors for journals. And it involved uh, an ethical uh, situation that I wanted to share with you. And the other one is uh, I, I also happen to write a little chapter on ethics for, for yeah, research students. So, I've, you know, as you can hear, I've been uh, talking, thinking about ethics a lot. So I wanted to get your opinion on some of these things. So let me share Sounds that great. first. Let me share that first story real quick. I think it's a pretty simple case, but I think there's more to it than it lets on. So um, got a paper submitted to a journal where I'm an editor and, um, you know, it looks OK. So I get a, a, a colleague to look at it and the colleague uh, calls me up and says, I've seen this paper before. Right. In fact, I handled a uh, submission by the same guy on the same topic with the same data, with the same idea for the same journal, you know, a couple of months ago. And I said, OK, uh -huh. well, that looks like, you know, that that's not a good, good situation. So we looked it up, um, did a little bit of research um, and found out that particular paper in five different versions was submitted over the course of more than a year to the same journal over and over again. Now, it was rejected every single time. Like how many times? Uh, five in a little wow. bit, five times. And, you know, it, it happened by, by, by chance. It always got assigned to different editors. Right. And, and mm. I just happened to call on a colleague that was involved prior. So through random chance, we realized, oh my God, this was happened before. I didn't, hadn't seen that paper before. Anyway, so uh, we looked at the decisions, we looked at the paper versions, of course, as well. And it's really, you know, same idea, um, same data, um, re rewritten, of course, right? So, um, but the, the decision was also clear. It was always rejected. Not, so they not did rewrite it though. They, they rewrote it a bit. Yeah, so they revised it. Yeah, you know, in a way as well, right? So we, uh, we confronted them. Um, and in and said, hey, look, guys, this looks like a breach of requirements. You you know, when you when you submit, you confirm that it's not a previously rejected manuscript. You actually explicitly confirm that. And the initial reaction mm -hmm. by the authors was, oh, we didn't do anything wrong. I don't see how we breached any requirements. And then we said, look, you know, it actually explicitly states you cannot submit a previously rejected manuscript again, which you did. And the uh, author uh, replied and said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, honest mistake, which I believe is true, honestly. Um, and uh, so wait, how can you believe that's an honest mistake if they checked off the box? Well, and... you know, it's sort of we, 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 we were multiple people and we looked at the situation. We looked at the correspondences that we had. I, I do believe it was a mistake. I do believe. No, it, I do believe that the person really didn't know that that was an ethical standard, that you can't do this. And he in the, the person. Uh, also, in, in one of the emails that, um, oh, look, I, I, I thought if I, you know, work on the paper some more after it got rejected, it's OK to resubmit it. Hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I, I do believe that was the case. So that's not the point of the story. Um, so the point of the story, I think, is two is number one. Uh, obviously, there's, you know, there was a lack of awareness. But also, don't you think it's funny, like the, in all the journal submissions, you have to tick check boxes to provenance declarations, to code of yeah. conduct statements, which list a lot of these ethics requirements and guidelines and mandates and stuff. You know, and it doesn't do shit, frankly. Right? Yeah. So people tick off the box in the same way that you accept cookies these days, right? Um, mm. So yeah, so that, that got me thinking about ethics because I do, I do believe that guy, that person, you know, wasn't consciously violating ethics. I really well, think he did I don't that. know about that. <clears throat> I think they were consciously violating ethics. I think uh, when you check the boxes, it's not that long of a reading. I, I think this is the problem. I think people rationalize. You can rationalize all sorts of unethical behavior. Well, and we you have mean some exposed afterwards? Well, and, and during and whatever. And, and uh, you know, we have this weird kind of incentive system in our where, where there are only a couple of journals, right? MIS quarterly. And, and if you're not getting MIS quarterly or ISR, you're not in a certain stratified space. And, and that takes, that means people will do so. So I could tell you a story uh, at MISQ and I'll just go ahead and name the journals, right? We, we're at MISQ, I get, uh, and I just moved. I was on the editorial board of ISR and I moved over to the MISQ editorial board. I get a paper, it's an experiment. Send it to my buddy uh, James Gaskin at uh, BYU, uh, 
and uh, as a reviewer, and he comes back to me and says, wait a second, I just reviewed this paper at ISR, right? And, and he's reviewing it for my SQ. I'm like, oh, all right, did it change much? He goes, well, let me check. So he looked at it and he says, well, it changed very little. Uh, but if you look at the statistics they're reporting, uh, we had a problem with it at ISR and it was one of the critical issues and we rejected it at ISR because of these critical issues. Uh, and it looks like everything else is the same, but they change the numbers in their table. They outright change. And the authors were accomplished people, uh, at least one of them. And it's like, holy moly. So we actually said this to them and they withdrew their paper from MIS quarterly, right? Well, that's it. Now, we'll say no further correspondence no fallout they just said sorry we'll take it back yeah wow so there and That's what were, what were we supposed to do publish uh, these people are bad you know i well, mean how, you, what do you do you know, to a person who, who takes it so so that's what we did is we put a note and we said listen this is the same and and can you explain why these numbers are changed and then they withdrew the paper right that's it so see see that's i think that's a very different situation so in our case it was not an accomplished scholar we looked up the institution and the scholar as well so it was a uh, really was very hard to find any details about them. So it was not, you know, major league university with major league author or anything like this. So uh, it was really weird. So that's why I also think, well, that's not a guy that's gaming uh, the publication. Well, but the incentives are the same, Might right? Be, it's this yeah. issue that you're so desperate to get a hit in but, the top journals. Your tenure matters. You're, you're right. That, that you'll... Well, let me get back to that Orange. systemic issue in a second. But but first, so we thought, all right, so there's a due diligence process. So, you know, you could you could uh, notify an ethics review board. For example, in our association, AIS, we have such a board. And what they would then do, uh, you know, they have an obligation to then inform the institution and so forth. We oh, wow. opted not to do that because we thought the editors involved, we all thought that, you know, this was really a lack of awareness and we didn't want to make matters worse for that person. In the case that you're telling, I think I would have said, hang on, that's not okay. You can't just do that and then just withdraw the paper as if nothing happened. That is fabrication mm -hmm. by, mm -hmm. by people from what you tell me that, that should know better, Yeah. right? And in that case, you probably would have gone to a comedy. I've done that in the past, right? I had cases where I had literally had double submissions. I was, you know, random, mm -hmm. random situations. I was reviewing for two different journals. And I literally, within a couple of weeks, I got the same paper submitted in both journals. They all both ended up on my table. Um, mm -hmm. Where I also thought, like, you shouldn't be so stupid, number one. Number two, mm -hmm. when it comes to reviewers, it's all this... You know, it's a small world. A small community. It's a small they, community. They Google, you know, they find Who the else keywords. would you think would get this paper to review? It was sort of obvious they would end up with my paper. Like, so, yeah. you know, that's an, that's another thing. Uh, but let me get back to the systemic issue. I don't know whether you know this case. This was a very public, famous case in Germany. It's not that long ago. It's the case of Ulrich Lichtenthaler. Have you heard of that name? Sure. Yeah, yeah this yeah, so is he's a technology a, he, and innovation management. That's right. Research. He's an open innovation researcher from Mannheim, which is one of the top business schools here. And, uh, you know, in 2010, 11, 12, he literally hit all the FT50 uh, journals, all of them, right? Academy yeah. of Management, Strategic Management, what have you. And the work, I read it at that time, it looked really interesting too. And then there were uh, some concerns over some of his papers. And then there was a formal investigation and it literally found all the ethical breaches you can think of. Plagiarism, mm -hmm. self-plagiarism, data fabrication, data omission, what have you, yeah? Um, and, you know, so at that time he was really big, even in the public news, you know, rising 40 star, 40 under 40, best researcher in Germany, blah, 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 all this, all this jazz. And, uh, you know, and then obviously they launched an investigation internally um, and it's, the papers got retracted. He, he, you know, he withdrew from his post, etc. Yeah. Now, did you also know that he's back in the game? <laughs> no, really? Well, he, he was a good I, writer. I remember reading after yeah, so I cited I his papers. stuff. Yeah, I cited so his I. stuff Absolutely. actually. And uh, I remember after all that controversy came out, I went and read a couple of those papers that, and they're actually quite nice. Right? They are they're quite nice. Well, well I, I like the ideas good, too. Yeah. The front ends. Yeah. Anyway. So yeah. So he, he has got a position with uh, some uh, college now. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, so I don't know since when, but he, he does have one now. Um, but 
I do know that, that at that time, he at some stage, he made the, uh, the statement saying, look, you know, this is a systemic thing. I felt pressured. I, you know, this was the, the publication system that sort of coerced me into this, uh, which is basically the argument you just brought and said, oh, look, you know, I could, you basically said, oh, I understand why these people are doing this because there is something to getting a paper in one of these top journals. And that's basically what he said as well. It is. And I mean, it's the same argument for, you know, people doing other corrupt practices for cash. And you know what I think is really funny is that it's clearly a European thing, right? And <laughs> the Europeans are clearly more unethical than, than Americans, for example, because not only was there Lichtenthaler, but have you, you know, this Diedrich, Diedrich Staple guy, the social psychologist from the Netherlands? Do you know this story? No, I don't think I do. He no. had something like, yeah, he was bigger than anyone. He was bigger than that. Uh, that old guy, Schoen. Yeah. Uh, remember, I, that's like the, that's famous, the famous corruption. Case, yeah. yeah, but this uh, this staple is actually bigger. He, uh, I think, had 30 students, and he would just give them the data. He'd say, I'll collect the data. You just write the papers. So over time, and, and they finally busted him. It was really funny. Apparently, it was political. He got a job in administration at his school, and he was prolific researcher, right? And uh, he got... Uh, some sort of administrative position. And then his enemies in his administrative position started getting upset with what he was doing. So they went and tried to dig up dirt on him. And uh, that's when they found out that in some of his papers, he was talking about some train station. Uh, and then they went and looked at the train station. And I don't remember the details. It was something about the trees and benches. And they're like, wait a second, there are no benches and there are no trees anywhere near this train station. So then they started digging in and they realized. And in the end, they got him to uh, admit wow. to pretty much faking so, all of this. Let, I want to go back to your provocative, this is a European thing. So uh, I want to I want to dig that up a little bit because my, my theory, my hypothesis is that it's, let's put it this way. I think it, I, I am... I know more cases where that could be problematic from an ethics viewpoint here in Europe. That is, but but also because this is where I spent my time, right? So you know, how the hell would I know anything about the, that goes on in, in the states? We don't hear about these cases at all. These are just hush hush talks at conferences, really. Some of the cases, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so but I will say this: um, from what I've learned and what I see is being done at the moment, there is no ethics in training. So I'm not you know, too surprised that we get situations that where people have literally no idea that they can't resubmit rejected papers and, and you know, other sorts of things. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, did you get ethics training mm -hmm. in, in your PhD program? I don't, not a, not a, yes, we do actually. At Case Western in mine, we did. We did have a, like this lame little teaching class and then this little research ethics requirement, right? But But a lot of that was the, and then there's, of course, the uh, the requirement to do IRB. So we know IRB and yeah. you guys have something yeah. similar. It's not called IRB. Well, you know, in, in Australia, we do. But in Germany, uh, it, it's sort of slowly coming up. Like in, in Cologne, where I'm at the moment, there is IRB, but it's voluntary. Yeah. So you're encouraged to do that, but you don't have to necessarily. But for many projects, like a funded, publicly funded project, you have to do that because you have to state your IRB number, your rev review board clearance. But, you know, historically, yeah, it didn't. And for many cases, if you just want to do some research and publish that, then here, no one asks for a review. For, for yeah, no, not only do you have to do the IRB, but before you can apply for an IRB, you need your certification. And there is a certification body at all research universities, and you have to take these online classes. And it's everything from, you know, working with grad students to whatever, basically all the main elements of ethical research. So you have to take this course before you apply for an IRB. They won't let you apply for an IRB unless you've taken the, uh, and it's a certification. And, and my certification went from Case Western to Georgia. And then that I had to update it coming to Notre Dame. So you always have to be certified before. So yeah, there's a lot, of, there's a strong ethical. Wow, no, now, well, that, that, that's good. Like we don't, yeah. nowhere that I've been, do we have such a formalized process? Not in Australia, which is very strict on compliance and ethics and stuff. But it's not that I'm certified in any way and that I carry around my certification. I had to apply for ethics for everything. And I make in Germany, I do the same and I make my students do the same as well. But it's more from a training standpoint because that's all I learned. Also, I think if you have to deal with ethics committees, it makes your research design much stronger because yeah. they ask you questions such as, do you really have to get that particular piece of information? What do you need it for? Yeah. 
Yeah. And then, you know, you gotta, you gotta come up with an answer to this, right? Well, I think so sometimes I, it's good, but other times it's just a hurdle that's annoying. Uh, but there are, there, the only ethical violation I can think of in the last decade is there was a Harvard guy and that's why it was so big. And his name was Hauser. And he, uh, he did a few things that were suspect, but the only one he ever admitted to was a paper he published in Cognition. And he said there were, and his co-authors, you know, backed away from him and all of that. But I don't know what, what ended up happening, but it was a lot fuzzier than, say, the Lichtenthaler or some of the others, right? The state See, that's the thing. Or, like in, in, in the States, let's say you get convicted of an ethical violation. Does it mean you lose tenure? Because in Germany, Lichtenthaler, he's still, you know, in the German equivalent of tenure. He's still a tenure profession. That's unbelievable. Like he's still, you know state employee, blah, blah, blah. He doesn't, you know, hold this post in Mannheim, of course, anymore. But it's not that he, you know, he, he didn't get fired, so to speak. I don't, you know? I don't know how that could happen. Like, I think in the well, States, that, you know, that's in the States, you would not have a position, thing, of course, right? I don't think. Yeah. So when you talk about See, ethics, uh, the, the one thing that I think is the most interesting or, or one of the most interesting and the most common and even in your book chapter, you say it's probably the one you run into most commonly is the authorship. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to talk about this then. Yeah, coercive and ghost authorship. Let's dig into that. Because I also think that's where it gets really gray, so mm. to speak, the area. So uh, some of the things are really simple, right? I mean, like, don't fabricate data. You know, don't change the numbers in your tables. Yeah. Of course, you know. So that's kind of obvious. And if you violate that, it's pretty hard to argue you didn't know what you were doing. Yeah. Right? If you jump into your Excel table and just randomly change numbers, that's pretty obvious, I guess. But in, in, in terms of these authorship practices, mm -hmm. right, maybe we should tell the, the, the listeners, I mean, coercive authorship is where I demand to be, you know, named on your paper, um, maybe because I'm your advisor or supervisor, but I really haven't actually contributed all that much. Yeah. And ghost authorship is sort of the opposite where you give me authorship, even though I haven't done all that much. So wait, what does it take to earn authorship? What do you think? Is there a clear line that if you pass this line, you're an author? If you didn't, you're not. What's that line? See, I think, again, there's there's different guidelines for that. Uh, there are some that I like, and I tend to like the really strict ones. Mm -hmm. um, so if I go by the national guidelines in Germany, for example, the national guidelines, they say stuff that you have to, you know, wording, you have to participate in certain activities and the activities would be hypothesis generation data collection analysis writing or revision and editing that's a lot participate yeah. well that's a lot and you have to participate in some of these things so if i participate in the editing of someone else's writing you know i can interpret it this way that that's good enough mm -hmm. right so i think that's very weak yeah. you know I, I if i look at your paper and then find a comma you know somewhere mm. uh, that's editing right yeah. and and that should that apparently enough to to claim authorship yeah. so there's other guidelines that are like better out of medicine and stuff and they say well you have to substantially contribute yeah. to several or all of these activities so we have to be involved in the idea in the data in the analysis in the writing and the revision you know, mm -hmm. you can't just see, for example, in that sense, you, I can't just hop onto your project because I'm a better writer. Yeah. You know, you tell me what the story is and what the data is, but you, I, I write the introduction. That wouldn't be enough. Yeah. Right. But you see, it depends a little bit on what the guidelines are that you want to follow, because none of them are really enforced. And secondly, uh, you know, how you interpret them. Right. Even in our body, in our community, I think they're pretty vague and, and open and a little bit too weak and for my life. So the classic German, this is my uh, outside impression. This is the classic German research model, right? I am here, doctor, professor, and I've got my uh, empire of grad students. I've got 30 grad students, and then I've got a whole bunch, of, and then I work with these corporations. And what I do is I uh, facilitate. First of all, I fund it all. I get a bunch of money. I essentially hire all of these grad students, get them, you know, facilitate data sets and then have, and I manage, you know, 30, 40 different projects essentially with these students, you know, maybe they work with each other, work with senior people, they're doing all that. And then I, in the old days, they would say, oh, and by the way, I'm first author on anything you guys write because it's my lab. I think now, even in Germany, they're saying, okay, I'll be last author on everything, even in my lab. Well, uh, you know, there, there, historically, I think there's something to that, right? So I've seen that as well in IS departments and schools and so forth. Um, you got to say that, number one, I do, th well, I don't know, but I think in several places this has changed, at least the ones that yeah. I'm aware of. That this is less and less the case, so it moved from first author to laws. And I think also to not being on the paper in cases. Really? As mm -hmm. far as I know, this is me looking at it from an outside perspective. Like, I'm not in this group and I don't work with them. 
So that's what it looks like to me. You also got to say this is this this might be an nice thing. I mean, in medicine, in psychology, uh, that's compl- in, in chemistry, in some <clears> lab, that's completely common and completely yeah, accepted. If you did it in my too, lab, right? Um, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and on the paper, which is why some of these papers have 20, 30, 40 different authors on them, right? Um, so you, you're on this, uh, your science paper, your consortia paper. Yeah. I mean, that has what, like 20 authors on that? Well, the science is more of a commentary. It's like 14 authors. The nature paper has... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, like, did they all yeah, I don't know, contribute like substantially or did they participate? Well, you know, all right, there's, so there's got to be differences there, too. You got to realize we're working so that we work with a group. It's called the Stakeholder Alignment Consortium. And uh, we work with a whole bunch of cyber infrastructure people and a whole bunch of people who run. Uh, so these are science people, uh, not necessarily organizational uh, and IS folks. And yeah, that's that's what they do. Right. That's why we have uh, and the you know papers that use the Large Hadron Collider. Right. There, there are thousands of authors, and that's because you know the people who set up the infrastructure, who write the code, who do everything. Right. We're part of the project, and there's no one person. Uh, so, so in that sense, that's the argument I would say for the you know my caricature of the German her doctor professor. If you do think of it as a lab. And you do realize there are a lot of components and each paper is just kind of, it's not the end all of it. It's, it's a, it's a temporary output or a, a okay, occasional a output snapshot, from right? a like machine, a, a snapshot. Piece. Yeah. Then, yeah. then yeah, everybody, everything putting together is part of a collaboration. And these are outputs from the collaboration, periodic outputs. And, and maybe I contribute more in one, maybe a little less in the other. It's like any team, right? Uh, if you're, you play basketball, I understood that you played with Dirk Nowitzki, right? The famous <laughs> German. That's a, that's a very famous legend. It's an urban yeah. legend about, about me. I don't believe it because when I played you in one-on-one, oh, one, I it? totally destroyed you. So <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't believe you're that good of a basketball player. But let's, uh, but, but it's a team, right? And sometimes you don't, don't contribute for that game uh, as much as with other games, right? Or you're sitting on the bench one game. Uh, you're still part of the team. So there's that team... Mm mentality there are a lot of different pieces that bring in big science and is authorship so valuable that we must cling to it and keep anybody you know what's wrong with just saying hey let's be generous anybody who's part of the team let's include them on papers and if the if the head of the lab facilitated the research and works with us part of the team let's put them on this paper if that's you know the what's that, wrong that's a nice way to look at it but it's also very naive and idealistic way to look at it because the reality is also this the reality is, okay, let's be generous. Let's write this paper and everyone that sort of contribute a little bit. Let's just, in for, for the sake of it, we'll put them all on the paper. But what we also get to see is then people, especially if they have one of these papers, you know, they got this nature paper, they got this MIS quarterly paper, and then they go on the job market. Mm-hmm. And they, they basically, that's their market paper. They advertise themselves with this paper where they're sixth author out of, a, out of seven and uh you know and then i always sit there wondering why would you do that why would you be so stupid because then you get a question about the paper and you can't answer that so i've seen this over and over again where someone has an misq paper that's sort of like the top paper in their uh, publication cv one msq paper a bunch of other ones and they tend to present on that that that's usually their drug market paper even if it's not their paper so to speak because they're you know they contributed at some level to this but i've seen a case where someone who was fifth out of five authors Mm-hmm. So he was last name author, and he got a very simple st- uh, question about some of the stats, a very simple data analysis question. He could not answer it. Mm-hmm. And then he got a method question. He could not answer it. And he, you know, he could present on it for 20 minutes well enough. Yeah. Um, and, and it made me think, well, you know, what's the point here? Like, why would you come out and say, this is me, first of all? Yeah. And secondly, uh, you know... Mm-hmm. How can that be a good thing? How is then generosity even helping this guy? So your problem is not with authorship. Your problem is with how you then represent your authorship. Like if you ask me about our, our, uh, you know, the paper you mentioned in Nature, yeah, there are 20 authors. We actually wrote a much longer paper. I helped some of the thinking, but I have to say uh, it was, there were probably about eight people there out of the 20 who, including me, who wrote paragraphs, many of my paragraphs did not make it into the final because they- Yeah, I've had that too. And by the way, that nature paper was a really interesting experience and it tells, and and this is just a little distraction. We submitted it in December. Two weeks later, we got a revision and they told us 10 days. You have 10 days for the revision. We revised another, uh, you know, put it in fairly quickly. They uh, 
came back to us with some other points. We did those points. They said, okay, you're good. You're accepted about, you know, a month and a half after we uh, sent it to them. I like that. And then it was published in March, right? The following year. So four months, two rounds. Uh, it was probably three times the length with tons of data in it. They basically told us to remove all your data, <laughs> remove uh, a whole bunch of your conceptualizing and, and attention to say, you know, the stuff we do in organizational research where we attend to uh, the cumulative tradition. They, they're just like, remove all of that, get to the point, do this, this, and this. And then they published it that March. It was a really interesting experience. And, uh, and it just goes to show that, all right, we had that there. And then an MISQ paper takes six years <laughs> or can take. I've had them take. Yeah, well, it, take, it takes and, four. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it does. And, yeah. Well, we, we can come back to that at some, some yeah, other point. Yeah, no. But let me go back to your um, to this ethics uh, situation, because, you know, let me tell me how I handle this. Right. And then you tell me whether you think that's a good idea or not. So, for example, so what I ended up doing, I've ran into many of these situations. I think at some said someone showed me I have over 200 co-authors. So work with many, many people being European, many of them are European too. So I've been in these situations where I've worked with people and other people, usually senior people, head of labs, whatever you want to call them, said, well, you know, this guy has to be on the paper. And I usually would respond with, well, you know, he hasn't done anything. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to put them on my paper. Like it, usually we do this in the sense of, all right, he wants to be in the paper. Let's, let's give him an opportunity, right? Yeah. Send him a paper, say, you know, here, uh, can you have a go at gut knowledge, the background section, whatever. Yeah. Do something, right? You want to be on the paper? No problem. Do something. And then sometimes that happens. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes the claim persists. Mm -hmm. So, and I've, I've I've tried all sorts of strategy. I've been I've been hard, you know, not giving ground, saying you're not going to be on my paper. Yeah. I've been weak and saying, yeah, fine. So what whatever, happens when you're hard and say it. you're not going to be? Do you make an enemy? Yeah, yeah. It's very simple. Uh, yes, you do. And uh, some of these relationships are repaired later. Some of them are not. Simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that gets emotional, uh, and sometimes, yeah, I think that that you know. Well, what's I'm, going on with that person well saying, like, "Add me to your paper," right? And well, it's they, they from their they... point of view. For, for for example, one specific case was there was a person who uh, secured a grant, uh, and that involved traveling. For example, I was in Australia, so they sent a bunch of their grad students over to Australia, and they could you know live and research there for a while. And while they were with us, we would occasionally do research with them. And the, the person that actually, you know, did the grant application and did the entire management of the entire traveling, the network thing uh, was was in Germany. He wasn't coming. Right. And so we did research with one of these students. Really nice. Spend a year on doing stuff. And uh, and then in the end, the guy said, oh, I'll be on that paper. And I said, no, you're not. And, and the person said, well, yes, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I secured this grant. I'm managing this project. Yeah. Right. So, you know, and from their vantage point, that was a clear as goal, right? Saying, mm -hmm. yeah, of course I'll be on the paper. This is my project. I've been managing this. I've been also facilitating this, as, as you said, mm -hmm. I'll be on the paper. So in this particular situation, I've had that many times when this one, I said, no, you're not. And he, back and forth and I wouldn't give ground. And then, you know, what's he, what's he going to do? He did, literally didn't have the word file, right? Yeah. So if I said, you, you're not going to be on the paper, he wasn't on the paper. Um, and I, I do think that relationship is, is, is still sour now. Yeah. So, but most of the times it gets resolved in a way, and usually it gets resolved these days, is that I'm giving in and saying, yeah, fine. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of having this. I don't have, I really I, I've never had anybody say I'm on that paper, but what I do really? is early in the, in the process, we decide who the author team is for a paper, right? So, so papers are usually, you know, single efforts and, and that word document right if you're not on the list of the word document going around or you're not on the share of the google well that's not a protection then you're not a, i mean you're not an author uh and, and well, i've never I, had you anybody know, come to me afterwards and say add me no not that but what about the situation that he said all right we're going to write this paper together and that gets shared with everyone etc and some guys don't pull their weight yeah. like at all because it's not a single <clears throat> effort. It's an effort that goes for years of a multiple revision. So usually it also changes quite a bit on who's doing most of the work at any given yeah. point in time. Like you might you might write the initial paper, but I might just be better or whatever in handling the revision, yeah. right? So that changes well. Yeah. So what do you do with situation where you say, we're all going to do this, but then I'm just going to kick backs and never do anything. And I'm just sitting uh, like, you know, on the bat one. What do you do then? Huh? I so most of the times I just on. I don't worry about it. I keep if a moment part as of well. the original group, then they stay on and then I just maybe don't collaborate with them so much in the future or whatever. So. Well, but that is, you know, you're you're handing out ghost authorship. I mean, I do too. 
right? So the way that I've handled it for myself is that I'm going to say, I'll, I'll never be that guy. I'll never be that guy that rides the bandwagon where I don't pull my weight or, you know, more than my weight. Yeah. I'll never want to be that guy that sits in the back end and <clears throat> attends all the meeting yeah. and never does a single thing or a single meaningful thing, whatever. Yeah. I don't want to be that guy, yeah. right? So that's how I handle it. But it, strictly speaking, it's still not okay. Well, there's this entitlement. Like, mentality. There's an ent people ha again have an ability to rationalize stuff, and I think there's an entitlement mentality uh, for particularly senior people, where they're like, "Hey, my name is actually enhancing this paper." That's one way that they rationalize, right? So, uh, I funded like if they if it's their student or whatever, they can look at it from the old lab model and say, "I funded it." The other is I'm part of the team. Right. The other, and this is what I think is kind of interesting, is the idea, the, the, that elusive idea. This is the most fascinating to me because uh, successful ideas have many fathers. Right. And a lot of people and I find myself doing this where uh, as a matter of fact, there was one time and I, for, it was about fields and and, and different fields and, and how people navigate different fields. And I'm like, no one has written about this. It's all me. This is my idea and I wanted to, you know, and I put it in some of my papers. Now, I, you got to realize, I know Natalia, Natalia Lavina, she's at NYU. I know her work really well. Uh, I've read all of her work multiple times throughout my career. I don't remember each paper. Then many years later, I go back, I read one of her papers, I don't know, the JMIS paper, and she says that exact argument that I thought was my idea. And I realized, you know what, I probably read it in her paper. And then over time, digested it, whatever, ran into a situation, I generated the idea. You know, this idea of an idea is kind of weird. But, but, but I think that's where you get into a lot of two things. One is people think the idea is theirs. That's one thing that I've seen happen. And I've seen it happen with myself, but others as well. When I write something that I know I created, they'll come to me and they'll say, that was my idea. Uh, and then the other thing that I see is people always, so they think it's their idea. And, and more people have ownership of ideas. I've had my friends and senior people take what I thought were my ideas put in their papers, uh, right? See, well, how do you feel about that? Well, I've had that too. It's and tough. I, I do feel, I, I, exactly. I like, don't think they I, know I it was my idea. This, right? It's all out well, in the water. Don't, you, know, you know, you don't own it's an elusive, idea. It's also, yeah, exactly. But wait, yeah. That, that's one thing is the idea thing that we run into in academia. I had a PhD, when, when I was doing my PhD, there was this uh, student in accounting that, that would never tell anyone what he was researching on because he didn't want anyone to steal it, right? But that's the one. The other issue that I see in academia is people think they do more than they do. Uh, I think that's when you're done with a paper, everybody kind of over uh, uh, assesses their own contribution and That's an interesting one. diminishes other countries just a little bit uh, so let me let me jump on that because what i've seen also is where some of these situations these dilemmas on who should be an author on what position and so forth also appears between junior researchers let's say students and their advisors so from the student's perspective where i see it very often they come and say oh my advisor you know he's not doing anything like i do all the writing yeah, yeah. and that's not as simple as it is because I, I always say, look, there's, there's a couple of reasons for this. Number one, this is a pedagogical thing. You need to learn how to write. Exactly. You know, especially in the beginning, I could probably take the same idea and write it better than you. But if I do this, you're not going to learn anything. So yeah. you have to write your own papers. Yeah. yeah. I always say my, my students and my post say, you got to write your own papers. Don't let others do that. Yeah. So that's, that's one thing. There's this training aspect to it. The other one, I think, is from that perspective, the junior perspective, I think they're undervalue how much input intellectual input they are receiving that goes beyond putting words on a paper yeah. you know like i find a lot like i sometimes think i quietly to myself thinking like geez that that is really more my paper than yours you know you, yeah. you yeah. have you've been putting more hours into the writing but really that's my idea i told you to do this and i yeah. told you how to look at the data yeah. and i've been telling you how to write about it yeah. you've done most of it right so like you know so there's different ways to look at it sometimes I can instruct you and you just operate the mechanics in a way. If you think about it further, the same idea would be, why can't I be the researcher and I'm just hiring a ghostwriter? Yeah. Like someone that's really good at writing, like, like an, like an English guy. Well, what's wrong with you that? Know? I don't yeah, know see, if that's there's the a question. problem is, with is that. Is that right or wrong? If I hire someone. Well, I know that I think yeah. that people are doing that. Yeah. 
in certain regions, I think that's fairly common to have ghost riders. That's my... Maybe East Asia, uh, uh, just to make sure that... Yeah, I don't know. Probably, you know, probably like certainly somewhere in non non English speaking countries. Yeah. Um, I think uh, like this is just an observation. Like I, I see sometimes people and they really struggle to put the words together when you talk to them. And if you are in comedies together where they really have to put down words in writing, that's also pretty awkward and not yeah. so nice. And then you read the papers and they're flowing, you know, they're yeah. beautiful. Brusival yeah. Prozac, right? Yeah. Um, and I always I'm like, how the hell do you, do you manage that, right? Um, so it could be all sorts of reasons, but I think uh, one of them could be whether there's a ghostwriter involved. And I don't think that's okay, yeah. right? Isn't, isn't that one of the principles to say like, look, honestly, uh, authority, y y y your work, you got to write about it. Because yeah. otherwise, why don't we all, all go to the literature department, get a good guy, you know, who read a lot of Shakespeare and who can probably write better than us and let them write, yeah. right? Yeah, it's tough. Well, what is it you're, when you publish a paper, what is it you're publishing, right? If it's an experiment or a bit of... Uh, you know, empirical research or something like that, that's it, right? So if you conducted the experiment and everything and, and you're just not comfortable in English, why not hire an editor to take care of that, right? If you're putting forth some novel conceptualization without the research, without the data, and you hire someone to express your ideas, that's a little fuzzier to me because it's like, you know, well, so much of the of idea is embedded in. in the way it's presented, right? We're not a medicine of psychology where we really factually, neutrally report in experiments on this is what we did, this is what we found in a story. Mm -hmm. These papers are easier to write. They're also short, by the way. Yeah. Uh, so we have to theorize and conceptualize and do all that sort of stuff. So we have to be more of a writer. And you, depending on who you ask, some people would say that, you know, qualitative guys need to be particularly good writers. Yeah. Not sure that's true, but, you know, let's go with that for a second. See, here's a story. One of my first papers uh, almost 15 years ago, um, was in information and management, you know, and at that time, Edgar Sibley was the editor. He was the founding editor. He was an old guy at that stage. But the way that he um, handled papers was he you would go through the review process, I think two, three, four rounds, can't remember. And then the paper was accepted. And then Edgar would take your paper and edit it like mm -hmm. an editor, you know, mm -hmm. and I mean, so my paper was 20 pages and the published version was eight, mm -hmm. eight. You know, yeah. so he, you know, he took it, it was with word track changes and it was red. I mean, he really reconstructed this entire paper. Yeah. And tell you also what, it was way better. Yeah. Like at that time, I was just convoluted and lengthy and whatnot. But, you know, people don't do that anymore, right? Yeah. But he was still old school and said, I'm an editor. I'm going to edit papers, yeah. much in the same way as book publishers, you know, good, good publishing editors would do as well, but not scientific editors anymore, yeah. right? Do you edit papers? Yeah, no, 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 no. I'll give them some, a little bit here and there, but I assume someone else is handling the grammar. Uh, Lynn Marcus once told, you know, her 1983 paper on power and politics, that very famous paper. I think she said once something like uh, the editor went back and forth for something like nine or 12 rounds with her, just very quick rounds, just very much. But I think, you know, that level of editing, they, they do that in journalism, you know, that that is probably, I don't know. Uh, uh, well, I had the same. Like, I don't. Time I, to do that, right? I well, some of them, my early papers. I had a JS paper, one of my first, again a long time ago, and it was handled by Yair Wand from from University of British Columbia. And after, basically, after all the review comments went on, we did another three rounds with him, where he literally was nitpicky about words and terms. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was like, "What are you doing?" But you know, in hindsight, I was like, "Oh wow, he made us to be that more precise, etc." Yeah. My first MIS quarterly paper, same thing. It was handled by Yuani Ivari mm -hmm. and Andrew Burton Jones. Yeah. <laughs> you know, back in the day, yeah. uh, and they really, after four rounds, we spent another two rounds with you know that long a list of requests for change that sentence, change that word. Wow. Do you really need this one, right? And I, 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 I kind of like doing that again. So I kind of do that a little bit in my editing mm -hmm. as well towards the end. And no, you do too. You're pretty strong an editor in that sense that you really, you know, you don't force people to do this, but you make fairly strong suggestions on, on anything, on titles and abstracts and whatnot. All right, what so think? let's go back to the, the uh, authorship. We didn't really- uh, No, we didn't read anything. <laughs> Uh, but I think that, that there's a, a general, I mean, I tend to be a little more, but what about the idea thing? What do you think about that? Do ideas get you authorship? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. I think ideas would be one way, 
uh, to uh, claim authorship rightfully. But as you said, they're very fluid and it's very hard to really demonstrate that was my idea. So I had, you know, if you look, if I look back at some of the cases that I was, the ones that I still get fairly emotional about are actually about the same thing where I felt that I had an idea and someone else went with it, usually then without my involvement. Mm -hmm. I'm like, and I see papers coming out saying, that's my idea. How dare you? You know, so I, I still feel fairly strongly about that emotionally. So um, so that goes to show that there, there's something particularly about this. And the, same, the point that I made about students not realizing the input they receive and how much sometimes that could be worth, I think is similar. Mm. And, and, you know, I think that I'd like to think, I'm not sure this is true, I'd like to think that people went off with my ideas more so than I've went off with other people's ideas, although I'm sure that happened as well. Yeah, hey, you never know. <clears throat> I think that, yeah, so it's one of those things where is your idea really your idea? You think it is, but, you know, and, and maybe it was. Maybe you're an original person and you, you generate a lot of ideas, and, and that's great. Uh, but, you know, I have to say, as someone who thinks that I generate a lot of ideas, I think it's very interesting to to realize sometimes when I'm reading something I know I read a decade ago that, you know what, that wasn't my idea, right? So it's like we so, think it's our idea, but it isn't. And I bet you other people do the same thing. So if it is your idea, the other person might not know it or the other person might think it's theirs. You know, it's, it's very tough. So to what, to what point do you stand up and fight? If you have a particular view about it, well, what are you going to fight? Like in my case, where it's like I get emotional about it. You speak up. You're going to say something, or you just let it, you just let it go on. I mean, for me, you say something about it, and then you let it go on. I mean, there's not a lot we can do. What are you going to do? Uh, get, okay, there's not much you can do about it. <clears throat> I wanted um, I wanted to shift a little bit because this is something that I tried to research a little bit. I found surprisingly little. Of, of, on it at all, right? So I was Googling it, etc., and it didn't find much. But the, the, the terms I wanted to throw in are citation cycles and uh, authorship writing cycles. So the idea of, you know, between groups of people, we're going to say, oh, you know, let's we can all win here by, I write a few papers, you're, you're on it, and ideally, you know, I don't know, you're handling my papers and I'm handling yours, and we all just make sure that we all accept each other's papers. Oh, right? you mean so, like I'm an editor at a journal, you're, we don't yeah, write together. You know, and, and, you, and I'm at a different one, and you submit to me, and I submit to you. So there's a variety of dimensions to it. So I know that people sometimes uh, deliberately choose who they work with and not to make sure that whoever they don't work with ends up as their editor. Yeah. Right. So and you know, sort of like I make sure that I never work with this guy because then that guy could be my editor yeah. for some reason or others. Or the opposite is, of course, is I'm going to I'm going to send you my paper before I submit it. So that way you can't be my editor. Hmm. <laughs> so I'm going to send it to the guys that I don't like because then I'll create a conflict uh, and they can't be my editors. That happens quite a lot. Wait. Right. Wait, wait, wait. So if someone sends me their paper because this has happened at MISQ and they say, hey, is this good for MISQ? And I say, no, 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 that's an, this, as, this as and this, an and then I get it as an editor. They can do that, right? They can do that. But what, what I've seen uh, people do is uh, they send a paper to reviews they want to avoid. And they send it up front and said, oh, by the way, before we... Uh, before we submitted this paper, we worked up the paper to get some constructive feedback. We sent it to these and these people. You should be aware because, you know, they can't be our reviewers anymore. Ah. I've seen that being done. You see oh, what I mean? Like, you know, you, you send it to your evil opposing reviewers up front and that takes them out of the game. Hmm. I think that's being practiced a lot, to hmm. be honest. Well, there's a little bit of unethical, but that's ga gamesmanship. I, I, I think it's probably wrong but i think at a lot of journals you can just put down who you don't want as your reviewers too you don't even have to do the game of yeah but how many people do you i know you can but how many people do you know that do that i feel i find most people uh, you know that's a more general issue i think most people sp should spend a little bit more time on that cover letter yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> instead of saying hello here's my paper please please have a go at it yeah. you know i because you can really take some you can influence the process a little bit in, in, you know, which is fine, I think, uh, in, in, in whatever ways. Um, but so I was trying to find some data or some examples or some writings about these, these cycles, right? So mm -hmm. sort of, I publish your paper, you publish mine, everybody wins. Um, or these citation cycles, which is a derivative of this. There's a uh, legend anyway, that certain nationalities do this, that the, the, and I guess I shouldn't, it's not German, at least that I know of. <laughs> But there are certain uh, ethnicities that are very high pressured to publish. And as part of their community, they <clears throat> uh, kind of have a tit for tat that, you know, if you're kind of a patriotic member of our country, you must 
uh, you know, and, and I think, uh, I don't know, it's probably a decade ago now in the top journals, there was a little bit of that. So they, they started being a little bit more conscious about who the editors are and the reviewers are and to try and get some, you know, uh, Americans on the board and, and stuff like that to make sure that that uh, kind of reciprocity thing doesn't happen. You know, so I think that's gone, but there was a little period of time where that was there uh, in MISQ, at least from what I've heard. I think, I think as long as you have, as long as you run a system that can be gamed, which is any system, mm. um, you will always have uh, um, ethical violations. This is as simple as that. It's, it's like they use a sports metaphor. Do you really think there's no doping in tennis? But just because it, it doesn't appear to be so? Well, like, when I the stakes are really so high. Stupid. These are people's exactly. futures. Right? Right? These are... That's the same with us. I mean, we have situations where, where people depend on that paper to be accepted and they have wife and kids and everything, right? And, and it's a tough, tough, tough job to get into. We've all, you know, so of course the stakes are really high, yeah? And so as long as that's the case, you will see uh, all sorts of ways, legal, illegal, ethical and unethical to try to, you know, maximize your output. That's what you get. But, you know, you can't help that, I think. I mean, any system can be gamed, yeah. right? It's just yeah. the nature of things. You will always have uh, cheating in sports. Yeah. And I, think I, don't, the, I don't see any way around it, right? And I think the authorship thing is definitely going to the point where authorship has to matter less in the future, right? Because we're getting bigger and bigger teams. More and more people are being pressured to publish so much that, that we're on these teams. And, and I'm on teams as well where, you know, we have a couple of papers. Uh, you know, I'm on this one group. We're looking at help desks, IT help desks. We have a paper that we're... Uh, in upper rounds and hopefully that one's going to get published. We have another empirical paper after that. And then we want to do an analytical modeling paper. And you know me, I'm about as useful on an analytical modeling paper as I am. I mean, I'm not useful. As a, as a hedgehog. <laughs> right. I can, I can write the introduction and the rest of it. Yes. I, I don't really uh, know. Now, should I be on that paper? It's our team. I've been, you know, should I, in, in your world, it's, I, I think it's perfectly fine for the group. I'll learn. How to do it. So should I recuse myself from just that paper? Because I know I'm not really, I mean, I'll talk to them about it. We'll have ideas. See, like this is one of these cases. So the way that I've handled this over recent years, because I've been getting more and more anal about these things, really anal, I can't put it, put it any other way. So I recuse, recuse myself. So I, uh, I have several papers where I say like, oh, I'm sorry, guys, I don't feel that like I uh, live up to my own little standards here, which I don't think are really meaningful or appropriate. They'll just, Staggeringly high, uh, and I recuse myself. So I end up on yours? fewer papers. So in this yeah, in still, this particular see, series, that's what I mean. It's not a healthy thing to do, and I think it's because of experience I've made in the past, and 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 so forth, and how much I want to avoid some of these. You know, you, you came up with some of these stories. You, you know, the German mm. professors and so forth, and I so don't want to be that mm. that I actually you know tip the You're scale too the much to the other side. Mm. You, you see what I mean? And that's why I get so anal about people that I feel shouldn't be mm. on the paper. Whereas <clears> maybe they should, you know, because everyone's contributing something. I mean, of course, they're not going to sit there for a month in all the calls and never say a word. What if the idea you know, is mine? Not. What if this is an analytical modeling paper? You know, I'm not. But the idea is actually mine. I think there's, uh, I've done analytical ideas. work and, 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 and I think that's, that is fairly simple to be honest. I mean, in analytical simulation work, one guy has to run the code. It's pointless to have seven guys run the code. So yeah, I think there's men, plenty of ways to contribute from the introduction, which is very important to papers anyways, you know, to the idea, to just, you know, interpreting the results, bringing them back up to the conceptual level. You know, many things that don't necessarily mean that you write a lot of text necessarily so i i wouldn't be you know i don't think that that that's a, that's a concern at all mm. right well i think the way that we have to deal with it is all right here's and this is the number one problem that leads to this whole authorship uh, issue is that yeah we get a number of papers is how people are evaluated even in the most you know in its number of papers in particular journals so of course we're going to have a thing where we have bigger and bigger teams working on more and more papers because more people can knock out more papers, right? So, so we're gonna see that. So we're always raising the bar on how many papers we expect here in the States for tenure, right? Um, when I started, they would say, oh, three or four at good schools, three or four, you know, top tier MISQ, ISR, yeah, yeah. And, and then a pipe. Thing. Now it's moved to, you know, four to six. six uh, yeah, exactly. Some schools, yeah. it's more like eight, 
you know, depending on the tradition, if you're in that econometric space, right, it's, it's probably closer to that. Uh, so these numbers are inflating, the teams are getting bigger, we're, it's got to get to the point where authorship gets a little devalued somehow which is fine to me yeah. i think if you think about it i my, my neighbor here he's he's uh, in medicine and he's doing research in medicine and you know he couldn't care less he doesn't know how many papers he has and he has these you know because he's he ends up on papers where he's like oh yeah that happened in our lab you know it was yeah. one of the guys that is in the lab yeah. so yeah I wrote, he wrote some of the papers he, he ended up doing a little bit more and so they don't care anymore yeah. you know which is i think is the situation which is probably not a bad idea because then it would avoid situations like i two days ago i got an email from an american colleague who sends me the latest publication ranking where mm -hmm. i ended up for some reason i ended up above him and he felt obliged to send me an email pointing that out <laughs> you know and i'm like what are you doing like why don't you say like dude you, you know i've had an amazing year you had an amazing year everyone had an amazing year why do you right. send me this ranking list and point out on what number i am and what number you are yeah. like you, you know that's just such a weird thing to do oh, it's totally <laughs> weird this whole counting right business. so and, and that and ranking so is it, fun that's too much that ranking is fun because you want to see how you and then of course you click on the journals you have <laughs> to see <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> to see where you are in the best possible light that's like the temple view right the temple is always number one in everything i always joke about young Jin, about this with young Jin when he was there is that depending on how you what they're number it, yeah. one in that year they you know it's his last three years last five years last year top two journals top five you know whatever it is they they sliced it up they were always number one in some category you know uh but yeah that that's that numbers game i don't know yeah anyway so i guess you know i think coming to a close here like so we talked about ethics, but we didn't solve anything. And we also don't have any meaningful, clear guidelines on people to say. I mean, other than figure out what your stance is and then, I don't know, stay, stick with it. So to have some consistency maybe in how you view things. And I guess what you said is important, like, you know, just, just talk about it openly, you know, early on. Like voice, okay, how are we going to deal with authorship? Who's, who's in or out of the team for, for this particular project? Yeah. That's probably a meaningful thing to do. And, but th that, that's really it, as we said, like, I think we will always have situations where we have these cases, whether it be a violation, a my mistake, a dilemma or whatever, I, that's not going to go away. Yeah. And to come out and say, like, oh, everyone needs training. Well, everyone should get some training in it. But yeah. that, again, that's not going to solve anything either. Yep. Right. It's the same as in sports, like people learn how not to cheat and they still end up doing it if it serves some, some goal that they pursue. That's just probably how it's going to be. Yep. People can rationalize uh, ethical violations somehow. But they still got to live with themselves. Yeah. They still got to be able to look themselves in the mirror and say, um, you know, I'm fine with how I, how I do things. Yep. All right, my brother. It's always fun. It's always fun. Let's keep it up. See you, Nick. Yep. Bye, Ricker.